that's great. So yeah, this is a joint talk. I think it's we are we are actually a tutorial, and we will show like demo code and everything. Uh, so let's let's take the next next slide. Uh, there's a strange thing in the middle of the screen. Okay, so yeah, the the target audience for this uh, tutorial is uh, uh, other kernel developers who want to add. XCP support to an existing driver. And as you can see from this picture, you will get really happy if you add uh, XCP support to a driver. Uh, so that's very positive, right? So let's, let's uh, look at the next slide. So some of the technical requirements, let's, let's, let's dig in into those. Uh, can I get the next slide? So, the XTP receive processing in, uh, that happens in the Nappy loop is actually quite simple. And I've managed to fit it all in, in one slide here. Uh, and I'm not going to go too much into the coding details in this slide because Lorenzo is going to take you through uh, some, some of the code for a specific driver. But the point, the point I want to make is the tricky part is actually changing the memory model to be compatible with, with XDP. And if you can just get the next slide. So for XDP, we have the frame that has to be in physical contiguous memory. Uh, and we need that because we are taking advantage of a BPF feature that's called direct access, which allows the BPF program to get direct access to the, to the memory. Uh, and this is uh, one of the things that, that can speed it up, right? And this direct access requires the physical contiguous memory because the verifier can verify that we don't go out of bound. But that also means that we cannot have data split across different pages. One of the other things is that we actually have direct read and write access to the DMA buffers. So you will see in later slides that you need to take care of the, the DMA syncing in your, in your driver. Uh, so that is part, part of um, some of the tricks you have to do in, in your driver code. Then another thing is that you have to disable jumper frames or larger MTU frames that goes beyond one page size when loading the XDP program. Uh, that is also a limitation uh, we are working on. We'll discuss that later on how we can get around this, but that is not truly upstream. Then we also have the XDP headroom where we actually store the, what's called the XDP frame area when we are redirecting frames around. We use, also use the headroom for pushing and popping headers through a helper function. And then we have reserved some tail room in this, in this page, which we use for uh, when we create an SKB. We have to have this area for the SKB shared, shared info. And all the, the drivers, they have to use or rely on build SKB, for example, when you do the XP pass. So in the, your driver, you're not allowed to have fragments of pages. That is, if your driver used the call that is mentioned here, the nappy alloc SKB, that is not something we allow for XDP drivers to do. Then in your driver, you have to have a rec recycle mechanism uh, that can recycle this frame at a very early point in, uh, to get some of the high speed. Uh, can I get the next slide? <laughs> So I said the problem is the memory model, right? So what we changed with XDP is that we force the drivers to explicitly say what kind of memory model they use. Uh, and I've listed the structures here, uh, as this is a coding tutorial where you need to look. I also list the API, as you can see. We will, we will show slides later that, that show you how to use this API to register a memory model. So the real advantage of, of doing this, having the drivers explicitly say which memory model they want to use, is that we allow to invent new memory models. And that has turned out pretty good so far. So we have the memory type page share, which is the normal ref count 
PageRef current base model. Then we have the page pool, which is optimized for HTTP. We'll talk more about that later, so thank you. Uh, Elias will talk about that. Then we have the SK buff pool, which is for zero copying into user space with the AF XTP socket. I'd rather, what I really hope to see is that we see new models being invented. I think at this conference, uh, Jonathan will talk about how he's building a new memory model that allows NICs to use memory that belongs to the DPU and and this way have direct DMA in, into the DPU memory and, and do funny things. I also imagine that people from the storage area will, will you take advantage of this so you can DMA directly into a memory that belongs to a storage device. So you can get the next slide. So this is the XTP architecture and I think we have so many slides uh, to, to cover that we can we can skip this one. Lorenzo, can you take the next slide? And then I'll hand it over to Elias. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So based on what Jesper tried to explain on the different memory models and the design principles we need and the XDP uh, restrictions we have and the specific requirements for the memory accesses, uh, we came up, there's a, there's a in kernel API uh, for allocating your pages, uh, managing the DMA that Jesper mentioned, and most, the, the most important thing is that uh, it automatically takes care of the, of the recycling capabilities and, and infrastructure you need to add on your driver to make XDP fast. So uh, XDP is fast for, for a number of reasons, but one of the, the most significant reasons is the fact that we, we managed to recycle the memory we were using on the network card in most of the cases. So can you move to the next slide? So uh, the design principles that uh, were considered before coming up and committing this API was that uh, this is optimized, this is mostly optimized, uh, the page pool is mostly optimized around the XDP memory model. Uh, ideally, and when everything started, this used to be a requirement, we had one packet per page, one, one payload per, per page. Uh, this is not true anymore since there, there's driver examples in the kernel at the moment that are splitting the page and that are using one page to, to fit in multiple packets. Actually, uh, they fit in two packets at the moment, but there's nothing preventing you to fit multiple packets in it. Uh, the only thing that you have to do is that you have to play some tricks around the reference count of the page and make sure that your page is not recycled when it still holds uh, valid buffers that you need to consume from the networking stack. Uh, now, the, another reason that the, the whole idea is fast is that we're trying to avoid locking uh, as much as possible. So considering the fact that we're usually running under an API loop and there's a software queue already in there, uh, we're trying to, to prevent extra locking. So you should, uh, when you're writing a, a driver model and you're using the page pool API, one pool should be allocated for every hardware queue. Uh, so you can, once, once the recycling hits in, you can avoid locking and you can recycle the packets lockless. Uh, there is still ex exceptions to this uh, because there's, uh, there's some hardware that due to its design idea and how the memory model operates on it can't do that. So you end up with a single pool for the whole, for the whole hardware and you end up uh, having to lock the, the pool. Uh, the, and this also, as I told you, this offers native recycling capabilities. So we keep two CASs. There's an in, an in soft IRQ CAS, which is the fastest one you can use. And there's a pointer ring CAS, uh, which we use to refill the, the in soft IRQ CAS uh, once that's, that's drained. And finally, the recent, we recently introduced, like, I don't know, it was five, six months ago or something like that. Uh, we can support your DMA syncing, mapping, uh, depending on the flags you're using when registering the pool for the driver. Uh, now this, this all sounds really nice, but that's, that's not exactly uh, that nice because the problem, there's a, there is an action problem 
due to the fact that you allocate a single page for a single packet, if you use the page pool allocator to write a simple network driver without XDP, you, ac you actually get a performance penalty compared to what you would get if you were allocating page fragments via Napia log frag or, or whatever we have in the kernel uh, to, to allocate pages, to, to allocate memory for your buffers. Uh, can you move to the next slide? So this is an overview of what happens on your network interface uh, once, you, once you start l l using page pool. So what happens is that when the device comes up, you create the page pool, uh, you have specific parameters that control the, the pool's behavior, like the, if you're going to map those buffers, if you're gonna sync them on, on, on every operation, uh, at which offset you should sync them, what's the maximum length you can sync, and what's the pointer cast size. So during the NAPI poll, you get an XDP decision. So depending on what happens on the XDP verdict you see on the slide, the page either gets recycled directly into the ring or gets recycled in CAS, or there's, okay, the, the slide would get too complex. There's even rare use cases where we don't recycle the page at all. Uh, but that's, that's a really corner case, a corner case that shouldn't happen most of the time. Uh, so after that, once the, the pay, if, if the pace goes back in the CAS and you're about to refill your, uh, your DMA buffers, then you do a get cast, a page pool get cast. So if the alloc cast is, if the alloc cast is full and you, you have pages to serve that, you get a page out of the fast path and you refill your buffer. If it's not, uh, then you use the pointer, uh, the pointer ring to refill the cases and uh, that's, that's a slightly sl slower path, but then eventually your DMA refill happens. Uh, you can move to the next slide. So this is, there's an, a detailed in-kernel documentation with, uh, with a schema that you can probably figure out exactly how page pool operates and how, how the CASIs are refilled. But the main things you need for the API is page pool create, which creates the page pool object. Uh, so you, you actually need to run this for, for every queue. Then you have the flags, which the flags we currently support is the DMA map flag, which maps your buffer. And there's the DMA sync flag, which syncs your buffer. Uh, then the order is the size of the, the, the page, you're, the, the memory you're going to allocate. Then you have the pool size, which controls the size of the pointer ring for your, for your cast buffers. Uh, then you have the NUMA node, and this is important because the, uh, when you first allocate a pool, uh, you're gonna get the NUMA node ID on the CPU you're running. Now, eventually this is going to change. And uh, so if, if this changes, and that's one of the corner cases, we don't recycle the buffer. Uh, we're also changing the NUMA node we're allocating and we're allocating from the closest NUMA node on the next, on the next request. Uh, then on the page pool create, you have the DMA direction, DMA length, and the max length you can, you can sync. Uh, then you have page pool put page, and this is a bit, uh, th this has two functionalities, and this is because, uh, as I told you in the beginning, you can, you can use a page and split it and fit in two buffers or three packets or however you wanna, how many packets you wanna fit in a page. Uh, so the outcome of this actually depends on the page ref count. If the driver is using page recycling tricks and is splitting the page, then the ref count is uh, greater than one. And what this will do is that we'll eventually unmap the page and the driver is in charge of it and he'll have to recycle it internally and figure out the ref counts internally. Now, if the ref count is one, it means that the page pool allocator is in charge of the page. So what it does is that it, it recycles for the network interface and it syncs it to the correct direction uh, that has to be seen to be used by the device again. Uh, then you have the, another helper, which is page pool uh, put full page. Uh, this is exactly what the page pool put, uh, put page does, uh, but it's uh, syncing the whole page. Um, then you have uh, release page, which unmaps the page and it, it, it accounts for the in-flight buffers. One of the details I forgot is that we keep some statistics for the pages we use and map because if the user does a mistake and doesn't free the, the page correctly, the moment you destroy the pool, you leave stale buffers on your DMA memory, uh, mapped as DMA. So uh, the release page is releasing the page and it's accounting for the in-flight counter. So you, you 
you won't get to warnings uh, while uh, freeing the pages. Uh, then you have the get the DMA direction and the DMA address, which are internal things that are stored in the page pool, and you you usually use those when you refill your DMA buffers for the interface. And you have page pool recycle direct, which is used on on limited cases where uh, you break out early, you have an error, for example, and you can recycle the packets really really fast. Uh, you can go to the next slide now. So this is, this is a dummy example of how you add it uh, on an actual driver. As you see, the order is zero, so you're allocating a single page. You, you only request it to map your pages. Uh, the pool size is the number of your descriptors. You choose no NUMA node. The device is just the, the, the struct device from the kernel and the DMA direction. That depends uh, on if you're using XDP or not, so if it's if you're using XDP, it has to be by direction. If you're not, you can just do DMA from device. And then you just create the page pool, you register the, the, you register the, the RxQ info information, and then you register the memory model, which is the, the thing that uh, Jesper mentioned on the beginning. So the, mem the memory uh, for XDP and for the use case is type page pool. Uh, next slide. So this is what happens on the NAPI polar, and this is what uh, this is the opposite side of what Jesper explained. So after your XDP decision or after your, your networking stack decision, uh, if there's some error, any error that makes sense, you can just go and recycle the page directly into the fastcast. If it's an X, uh, for example, if it's an XDP drop, uh, you can still recycle the page really fast. If it's a, if it's an SKB, you release the page with. Uh, uh, what does is that it destroys the memory mappings that you have since the page is still actively used by the by the network interface and you then allocate new pages either from the cache or directly for your RAM depending on, on how many uh, packets you manage to to restore in your cache and then you fill in your your DMA uh, descriptors and and push them down the hardware uh, and on the and once you're done with the driver and you want to unload it, this is the two calls that you have to put to to call in order to destroy everything, destroy all your DMA mappings, free the memory, and then register the memory model. Uh, yeah, that's it on the on the API, uh, Lorenzo. Yes, <clears throat> I can take the mic now. And uh, while uh, Ilias and Jasper introduce some general information about XDP and uh, page pool APIs, I will give some key concept about adding in XDP support to a, a real internet driver. And I will present some code snippet from the MFUNETA driver in particular. Uh, in this section, I will uh, present the page pool life cycle into the driver, for example, like creating and destroying the pool or refilling the DMA engine. And I will describe the XDP architecture uh, used in the, MVNeta, in the MVNeta driver. And I will present each uh, supported XDP verdict with some demos. And then at the end, I will present some new feature, some new XDP features that has been added to the driver. So in this slide, I reported the hardware specification of the Marvel Espresso Bean, that is the development board I used to add XDP support to the MVNeta driver. And we can see that uh, the Marvel Espresso Bean run a Cortex A53. And for networking, we have uh, two gigabit Ethernet LAN ports, one uh, fast Ethernet one port, and all of them are connected together through a DSA switch. So let's start with page pool lifecycle. And as Ilya said, the page pool is usually associated to, the, to an other RxQ in order to avoid locking penalties. So the page pool is usually created opening the net device and is usually destroyed closing the net device. MVNeta create page pool is responsible to actually create the pool 
and in page pool parameters, we have the pool configuration used in the MFUNETA driver. As Ilya said, uh, the order zero means that we are, we are using a single page for each buffer, while with flag, we are relying on the page pool APIs to DMA mapping and unmapping the page. And even uh, for DMA syncing the, the, the buffer since the MVNet, uh, the Marvel Espresso bin is not cache coherent. With DMA dir, we set the DMA direction, and we can see that if you are if you are loading an XDB program on the interface, we it is set to DMA, the DMA bay directional. In since we are supporting XDPTX and the NDO XDP uh, XMIT function pointer. Otherwise, it's set to DMA from device. Offset is, the, is where the DMA engine start copying the data, while max len is the maximum sync size supported by the driver. The pool is actually created running page pool create, while XDP RXQ info reg and XDP RXQ info reg mem model are used to as Jesper said to register the memory model and to track in flight pages in order to avoid possible memory leaks. Now let's consider MVNeta RX refill that is used in the NAPI poll in order to refill new pages to the DMA engines. And we can see that running page pool a lot pages we get page from the page pool caches if they are available in, and we avoid to going through the uh, standard page allocator. Moreover, uh, setting the DMA address, we reserve enough space for the, uh, enough space in the headroom to push new headers to the frame. And we cannot hear that we are not going to uh, sync the sync for device the page here, since the page pool will take care of this, uh, reinserting the page into the into the pool, running page pool put page. So uh, the buffers, the pages associated to the DMA engines, as I said are destroyed closing the net device. And uh, in particular, uh, MVNet RX drop packet runs a page pool put full page that is used to move the pages from the DMA engines back to the page pool. And then the pool is destroyed running page pool destroy. And uh, XDP RX RX Q in for reg is used to uh, unregister the memory model and to track the in-flight pages and to raise a warning if, for example, there is uh, untracked pages, not freed. In this slide, I reported the code run by the networking code and in particular by the NDO BPF pointer to load or unload a program, a, in a BPF program to or from the interface. As Ilias, Ilias and Jesper said, the MEVUNET XTP setup must uh, respect the XTP memory model. So uh, we, uh, the MEVUNET XTP setup fails if we are trying to load a BPF, any BPF program uh, and the MQ is bigger than a single page since for the moment we, just, we do not support jumbo frames for XDP, but we will see later that we are trying to overcome this limitation. Since uh, ABPF require the direct access and, uh, and uh, the physical memory associated to the buffer must be contiguous, we need to reconfigure the DMA buffer so what we are doing is just stopping the net device, load the XTP program on the interface, and then um, restart, restart the net device. Here we have the description of the 
uh, XTP architecture of the MVNeta driver, and we can see that the processing is starting in the NAPI poll running MVNeta poll. MVNeta poll is responsible to allocate on the stack the XTP buffer and to execute the MVNeta run XTP, that is the function that is actually running the eBPF program in the eBPF sandbox. And then according to the XTP verdict returned by the, the, by the eBPF program, we'll execute the proper code. For example, for XTP pass, we build the SKB and we forward it to the networking stack. While for XTP drop, we recycle the, as Ilias said, we recycle the page running page pool put page. For XTPTX, we running MVNeta XTP XMIT back, we forward the packet back to the interface where it has been received. And for uh, XTP redirect, we uh, redirect the packet with frame to a remote interface, for example, using a dev map or for example, using a CPU map. Using a CPU map, we can redirect it to a remote CPU as we will see later in the presentation. If the MVNeta device is the destination of, of an XTP redirect, we will execute the NDO XTP XMIT pointer, and then we will run the MVNeta XTP XMIT, and we will send the packet out. In this slide, I reported the main code, uh, the main XTP loop, and in particular the MVNeta RX software buffer manager. And we can see that the MVNeta poll receiving the DMA descriptor, uh, invalid CPU caches running DMA sync single for CPU since the espresso bin is not cache coherent. And then we initialize the XTP buffer, setting the data hard start pointer to the beginning of the page data pointer to the beginning of the data of the data copied by the DMA engines and data the end to the um, end of the data of the data copied by the DMA engine. Then we'll execute uh, MVNet run XTP to run the EBPF program. And according to the result, if the result is different from MVNet pass, MVNet XTP pass, we will uh, refill the DMA engines with a new buffer get from, uh, get from the uh, page pool. Otherwise, on the contrary, we will need to build the SK an SKB, forward the SKB to the networking stack, and then refill the DMA engine with a new buffer. In this slide, I reported the code related to the MVNet running XTP, where, as I said, it, we run, we actually run the eBPF program loaded on the interface. And then according to the XTP verdict returned by the eBPF program, we execute the proper code. We will see in the next slide that uh, we will go through each possible, each supported XTP verdict in the next slides with some demos. So, Let's start with XTP drop. As we know, XTP drop is returned by the VPF program in order to drop the received frame. And since that now the driver is running in the NAPI context and the page ref count is one, page pool put page can recycle the page in the in software IRQ page pool cache. And inside, if requested inside the page pool put page, the, the, the buffer will be synced for device with the proper size. That is the maximum between the, uh, between the sites copied by the DMA engine and the sites accessed by the eBPF program. Here we have a demo to show how uh, XTP drop works. See? So on the left, there is a serial connection on my espresso bin. My espresso bin is connected through the 
Ethernet interface with IP 192.168.1.2, as we can see. And uh, as we can see, there are no EVPF program attached to the network, to the network interface. While on the right, we have my desktop. And my desktop is connected through the Ethernet card with IP 192.168.1.30. So now uh, let's ping, uh, let's try to ping the espresso bin from the desktop. And uh, let's now on the uh, on the espresso bin, let's try to load a simple XTP program that just return it XTP drop. Okay, it's loaded. As you and as you can see, the uh, traffic is stopped. And we have loaded on the Ethernet card an XTP program with the ID one. Now let's dump some XDP ATH tool statistic from ATH0, and in particular, let's dump XDP drop counter. And as you can see, their XDP drop counter is, is increasing. Okay. So the driver is dropping, dropping the packets. Okay. Now let's try to remove the EBPF program from ATH0. Okay. And you, as you can see, the traffic restarts. And there are no, no more EBPF program on ATH0. Let's try to redump the same XTP drop counter. And then as you can see, the counter now is stuck. So it works. In this slide, I reported the packet drop in comparison between XTP drop and TC drop. And uh, during the test, I disabled DSA and I was sending a packet of 64 bytes. So loading a simple XTP program that just return XTP drop on the Marvel Espresso bin, we are able to drop roughly 600 kilopacket per second, while with TC creating a CLS act on the ingress to disk and creating a match all filter to drop all packets, we are able to drop roughly less than 200 kilopackets per second. Now let's move to XTP pass. And XTP pass is used to forward the frame to, net to the networking stack. In particular, MVNeta Software Buffer Manager RX frame relies on build SKB to create the SKB and to avoid allocating memory, since we take into account the SKB shared info at the end of the buffer tail room. So we don't need to allocate memory. And we can notice here that we need to run page pool release page, since to, to inform the page pool APIs that the page is actually leaving the pool, since for the moment, the page pool APIs does not support SKB recycling. And so the page associated to the, uh, to the SKB will go back to the page allocator. Here we have a demos related to show how XTP pass works. So as before, on the left, we have my espresso bin. My espresso bin is connected with uh, the Ethernet card and with the same IP, 192.168.1.2. 
and there are no eBPF program attached to, uh, to the network interface for the moment, as you can see. While on the right, we have my desktop. It is always connected with the same Ethernet card with the same IP 1.30. So let's ping the espresso bean from my desktop. And on the espresso bean, let's load a simple XTP program that just return XTP pass. Okay. As you can see, the traffic, the traffic is still flowing. And uh, we have loaded an XTP program with ID one on ETH zero. Now let's dump the some XTP ETH tool statistic from ATH0 and in particular the XTP pass counter. Okay. As you can see, the counter is increasing. Now let's remove the eBPF program from ATH0. Okay. The traffic is still flowing. And as you can see, there are no more eBPF programs on ATH0. If we try to dump again the same XTP pass counter, now the counter is stuck since there are no program on, on ATH0. So it worked as expected. Let's consider now XTPTX. XTPTX, as we know, as is used to transmit back the frame to the um, network interface where it has been received. And in particular, we can notice here that in MVNet XTP XMIC back that is run by MVNet run XTP if the program return XTPTX, there are no needs to uh, DMA map the page on the TX ring since it is already mapped but we just need to uh, DMA sync for device the, the page. In this slide, I reported the eBPF pro, the, uh, an eBPF program called SSH Mirror done by Matteo Croce in order that is, will be used in the next slide, in the next demo. SSH Mirror is used to swap for SSH connection is used to swap layer two and layer three addresses and TCP ports and return XTPTX. So if you try to, lo to log using SSH remotely and you have a running SS SSH server locally, what you're going to do is actually connect it locally. So let's see how SSH mirror works on the espresso bin. And uh, on the left, I, we, have, we always have my espresso bean, my serial connection on the espresso bean. It is, the espresso bean is connected using ETH0 with the same IP. And there are no eBPF program attached to ETH0 for the moment, okay? On the right is my desktop. The host name is Loredesk. And it's connected using the Ethernet card with the same IP. 192.168.1.30. As you can see, the connection to the Espresso Mini is working. So now, 
let's load the SSH mirror on the Ethernet card of the Espresso bin. As I said before, for SSH connections, SSH mirror, uh, swap layer two and layer three addressings, and TCP ports, and return XTPTX. Okay, the program is loaded. As you can see, there is an XTP program with ID1 on ATH0. Now let's dump some ATH tool statistics from ATH0 and in particular the XTP TX counter. Okay. And then uh, from the desktop, let's try to SSH into the espresso bin. Okay, as you can see the counter, the XTPTX counter is increasing and the host name is still Loredesk. So we are actually connected into, uh, into the, the desktop instead of the uh, espresso bin. Okay. Now, let's, uh, let's remove the SSH mirror from ATH0. Okay. And as you can see, there are no more eBPF program attached to ATH0. Let's dump some XTP ATH tool statistics. And in particular, the same, let's dump the same counter, XTPTX. And then let's try to uh, SSH again into the espresso bin from the desktop. Okay, as you can see now, the XTP TX counter is stacked and then and the host name is Espresso Bean. So we are now, we are actually uh, uh, connected into the Espresso Bean instead of the, in the, on, into the desktop. So it works. Now let's consider XTP redirect. And uh, XTP do redirect is run by MVNeta uh, run XTP if the eBPF program return XTP redirect. X, uh, doing the redirect, we forward the frame to a remote interface where we run the NDO XTPX meet function pointer, or if, for example, we can forward the frame to a remote CPU, as we can see using the CPU map, or to, for example, to any AF XTP socket. If the MMUNETA device is the destination of the XTP redirect, we will run the NDO XTP XMIC pointer and then MVNeta XTP XMIT routine. And we can see here that the main difference respect to the XTP TX use case is that now we need to, since we are now receiving the frame from a remote interface, we need to map the, the frame into the DMA engine running DMA map single. Here we have 
a demo related to XTP redirect. So on the top left is the, there is a, a, a serial connection on my espresso bin. The espresso bin is connected using ETH0 with same IP 192.168.1.2. And there are no eBPF program attached to ATH0 for the moment, as you can see. On the top right, there is my desktop. The host name is Loredesk and is connected using the same Ethernet interface with the same IP, 192.168.1.30. Okay. The connection to the espresso bin works. And on the bottom right, there is another serial connection to the my espresso bin. And on the bottom left, there is another serial connection on my espresso bin. Okay, so on the espresso bin, let's try to run QEMU. Okay. Inside this VM, there is a bash scripts, bash script uh, that is will be used to inject traffic, UDP traffic uh, from the VM to the TAP interface. Okay. On the espresso bin hypervisor, let's start the XTP uh, redirect BPF sample avail available on the in the BP in the kernel source tree, and the XTP redirect will be used to redirect the traffic from the tap interface to the MVNeta device. In this serial connection, uh, let's dump some XTP ATH tool statistics from ATH0. And in particular, let's dump XTP XMIT counter. That is the counter incremented whenever we run NDO XTP XMIT function pointer. And on my desktop, uh, let's start uh, TCP dump. Okay, there is some traffic. From inside the VM, let's start sending uh, UDP traffic to the TAP interface. Okay. And as you can see, the XTP XMIT counter is increasing and the traffic is redirected. The UDP traffic from the VM is redirected from the TAP interface 
to the emulated device, and the emulated device is sending it out to the to, to my desktop, as you can see. Okay. So the the demo is working. Now, let's consider, uh, now, this, we, we notice that the Espresso bin does not support uh, hardware received packet steering. So, all the internets are managed by the CPU zero, since the Espresso bin is dual core. Uh, so we got the idea to approximate hardware received packet steering with uh, CPU maps and XTP redirect. CPU maps are used to move the processing to a remote CPU, but so far they support just building the SKB and forward it to a networking stack. So what we did is extended uh, the CPU map in order to add the capability to attach any BPF program to the CPU map entries and to execute this eBPF program on the remote CPU. So with XDP redirect and CPU map, we can have something similar to a software received packet steering, since we receive traffic on the CPU zero on the Meruneta, and then uh, we perform an XDP redirect on the remote CPU, CPU one, and on this remote CPU, we execute another eBPF program that, for example, can perform an XTP redirect to another device. Here in this slide, I reported the code run by the K-thread binded to the remote CPU of the CPU map. And we can see that the K-thread run, K-thread the queue packet from a pointer in queue and execute the eBPF program attached to the CPU map entry. Here I reported the scenario that will be uh, tested in the next demo. And uh, we can see that we are, we are receiving traffic uh, on the MVNet on CPU zero. On MVNet, we will perform an XTP redirect on the CPU map entry associated to C the CPU one. And then the K thread binded to CPU one will execute the any BPF program attached to the CPU map entry to perform another XTP redirect on a virtual, virtual Ethernet pair. For example, VH0 running on CPU one will perform, will forward the traffic to the PR that is running in a remote namespace. So as you can see, most of the code is, ex is executed on CPU one. So we are kind approximating of other received packet steering with this, with this approach. So let's, let's see the demo. On the top left, there is, there is the, an SSH connection to my espresso bin. The espresso bin is connected using the uh, same interface and the same IP, 192.168.1.2. 
okay? And as you can see, for the moment, there are no eBPF program attached to ATH0. On the top right, there is my desktop. host name is Loredesk and is connected using the same Ethernet interface with the same IP. The connection to the Espresso Mini is working. On the uh, bottom right, there is an SSH connection to the Espresso Bean. And even on the bottom left, there is an SSH connection to the Espresso Bean. So here on the Espresso Bean, uh, we will have uh, a virtual inter Ethernet pair, PH0, VH1. VH0 is in the, in the init time space with IP 192.168.2.2. While uh, VH1 is in the remote name space with the IP 192.168.2.3. Okay. So, uh, let's start an IPF server on the remote namespace. And then uh, let's start the XTP redirect CPU sample available in the kernel source 3. XTP redirect sample will be used to create the CPU map, to create a CPU map with two entries related to the two CPUs available on the espresso bin. And then on, we will attach an XDP program, XDP CPU map zero on 880 to redirect traffic to the CPU map associated to CPU one. And then on CPU one, we'll we will attach uh, on the CPU map entries, entry associated to the CPU one, we'll uh, load another BPF program, XDP redirect IPERF to redirect IPERF traffic from the CPU map to the virtual Ethernet pair. So let's start the program. As you can see on ATH0, we, we, we load XTP CPU map program. On CPU, on CPU1, on the entry associated to CPU1, we load XTP redirect IPERF. This is available in XDP redirect kern object. And then we redirect from CPU, the CPU map entries associated to CPU1 pro to the virtual Ethernet pair. Now let's dump some ET, XDP ETH tool statistics from ATH0, and in particular, let's dump XDP redirect counter. Okay. Here, let's dump, let's monitor the CPU utilization on the espresso bin. And from my desktop, let's start, let's start sending traffic to the virtual Ethernet pair. Okay. 
okay? As you can see, the uh, load is balanced between the two CPU because on CPU zero, uh, the MVU Neta is receiving the traffic while on CPU one, uh, the CPU map is forwarding the traffic to the uh, virtual Ethernet pair and the XTP redirect counter on ETH zero is increasing Now let's dump some XTP ATH tool statistics of VH1. So, as you can see, the device is receiving traffic redirected from, from the MV Neta to the CPU map and then to the virtual Ethernet pair. So it works. Now, an important point to note is that in order to, uh, for XDP success is essential that XDP is easy to debug. So a proper stats accounting is fundamental for uh, XDP success. Upstream, we agreed to uh, increment, to always increment net device RX counters, even if the uh, program return XTP drop. And we will have some more uh, fine grain statistics through ATH tool as we, see, as we saw. For example, in the H ATH tool, we will have a counter for redirect, for XTP pass, for XTP drop, for XTPTX and for XTPXMIT that is incremented as we saw when NDO XTPXMIT counter is, in, is run. One point to note is that it is essential that all the drivers are relying on the same name convention uh, showed here. So now I will give the mic back to Jesper to talk about HTTP multibuffer. Yes, I think people can hear me. Yes, and this is, I, I want to stress that this is work in progress. This is not upstream yet, but we mentioned that we want to address the problem of how we can support uh, the jumbo frame stuff. And there's also a design document that we are following. I also want to mention that this is joint work between Amazon and Red Hat. So the future credit goes to uh, the Sammy and Lorenzo and Ilko who has volunteered to, to work on this project. Can I get the next slide? So the XTP multibuffer has several use cases. One of them is jumbo frames. Another one is the TSO, the TCP's uh, segment offloading and the uh, large receive offload, LIO. Uh, and there's also an interesting use case, which is packet header split, uh, which is where we split the, the, the headers into one, one, one segment and, and the data into an, another segment, which I think Google wants to use this to do some zero copy stuff into user space. <laughs> and something that most people don't realize is that once we have this, we can also get allow uh, GIO packets to go into a VHH and, and when redirecting a GIO packet into a generic HTTP, uh, we, can, we can actually handle this better and we can also do some optimizations for CPU map. <clears throat> but as we talked about earlier, we have the BPF direct access that is contiguous memory how do we satisfy that design when we all of a sudden have page, several pages that contain packet data? So the proposal is that BPF, we simply only allow BPF to only access the first uh, packet buffer because that's, the argument is that B, 
BBF or HTTP is meant for layer two and layer three, and it is likely that information you want, and the rest of the pages that contain more have have to be handled by not likely have to be handled by another layer. So this to solve other things, we had we chose to have the storage page for these um, multi-buffer segments and the reference to those at the end of the first segment in the tail room. And that is the same thing we do with the SKB shared info to mimic that behavior, which also makes it easier when we do FTP pass, because then we can create uh, an SKB based on the FTP frame in an in a easier way. So I chose to call the XDP shared info here. So this area provides some metadata. So for each buffer, we have the, the page pointer, the offset, and the length. And that's the same as when accessed the same way as we have the SKB frac of uh, fracs in, in the SKB. It also contains metadata of the number of segments and the full packet length. Uh, the trick here is that we only need a single multi-buffer bit indication in the HTTP buff and the HTTP MD uh, area. So that, that saves the fast path for when you don't need this multi-buffer. So you need to do the minimum amount of work. So the next slide. So in your driver, you need to modify the, the NAPI receive loop. So you take all the segments and, and Build, build this up uh, before calling XTP. So you have the XTP buff and you attach the, the segments to the, the shared info area. And then you run the XTP program when all the, the, the descriptors are attached to it. <coughs> and then we have some helper functions that can access this information about the, the, the segments themselves. And then you need to change the XTP TX and the NDO XTP XMIT to handle when you get these nonlinear buffers in and how to, to transmit this out. You have, you have mentioned the different uh, driver functions that were that Lorenzo demonstrated how to modify. This also means we can remove the MGU check when loading the XTP program because now we can support the, the jumbo frames and other use cases. So the next slide. So, uh, a drawing how, how this sort of works. So we have the, the, the first frame layout and that has the, the buffer zero and we have the headroom. And in the end, uh, we, uh, we have the shared info and the shared info have, have an array which, which would point us to, to what I described before. So that's, that's how the memory layout is. So the next slide I'm going to give to Lorenzo because it contains some code he wrote. Yes, actually in this slide, uh, this work as Jasper said is work in progress. And in this slide, I reported the uh, two functions that are already upstream. And this is the first series to implement uh, this is a preliminary series to implement uh, XTP multi-buffer support in the MVNeta. Uh, in particular, MVNeta software buffer manager other Rix fragment is used to create the XTP non-linear buffer receiving the uh, DMA descriptor. And as you can see, we access the SKB, shared, the shared, let's call shared info, uh, at the end of the first buffer. And then we link together uh, using the, the SKB shared info, all the subsequent buffers. And uh, in the while MVNeta software buffer manager build SKB will be used whenever the program, the EVPF program return XTP pass and will be used to construct a nonlinear SKB from a nonlinear XTP buff. As we can see, we build the SKB from the first buffer, and then we access the 
uh, SKB shared info at the end of the first XTP buffer to construct the nonlinear part of the SKB. And this, as I said, this code is already upstream while uh, I'm still, I'm actually working uh, on the second part to support uh, the XTP, so to support the TX part, we need to merge uh, some, uh, as Jasper said, some uh, metadata information to properly support the TX, the TX part. I will now give the mic back to Ilias to talk about how we can test an XTP driver. Yeah. Hello. This is mostly a sum up of what uh, you saw in Lorenzo's slides. Once you're done with the driver, you need to check uh, all of the functionality it offers. So these are the actions we, we actually require for a driver to be merged into mainline. You need to support uh, all of the XDP actions we, we have at the moment. So uh, first of all, the XDP pass. Uh, can you move on the next time slide, Lorenzo? So uh, the first thing is that you need, the, the kernel has a bunch of samples. You can compile and, and, and do the testing. So you can see on the middle of the page, there's a make M samples. Uh, so you, this way you can build all the kernel samples you want. Uh, so the XDP pass. The XDP pass is an easy one. Uh, you just need to verify that whenever you're sending traffic towards the host, if you load the BPF program that only allows XDP pass, you, the network traffic just continues to exist. Uh, so what you do is load a BPF program and verify that the, kernel, the, the packets are, st are still delivered on your, on your receiving end kernel network stack. Uh, the XDP drop is pretty much the same story. There's a BPF program in the kernel samples you can use and what you can do is uh, load it and make sure that every packet you send is dropped. Uh, next slide. So on the, the XDPTX now, the XDPTX as Lorenzo said, this means that you're uh, actually sending the packet back out of the interface it came from. So an easy way to verify that and since there's quite a few things that could go wrong during the driver development, you need to be accurate on your testing. So one of the things that we did during developing drivers was that uh, we started XDPTX on the receiving host and then on the, on, the, on the host that the XDP driver was running and then on your testing machine, you can start sending packets while starting TCP dump as well. Uh, as you know, the probably, as you probably know, the kernel has an API uh, that you can create an, a, a, a number of packets and send it over. So by using this and sending dummy packets, uh, dummy UDP packets, that's the important detail you have to notice here that the sample program in the kernel only directs the packet if it's only swaps the, the MAC addresses if it's a UDP packet. So by sending a, a discrete amount, a explicit amount of packets, what you do is that you open your TCP dump again uh, once you're done and you expect to find the exact same number of packets, which means that all of the packets you sent to the host got uh, redirected correctly and came back to you. And you can do this for, for a different amount of packets to make sure that the XDPTX functionality on the driver is correct. Uh, next slide. So the last one is, X, uh, not the last one, there's XDP redirect. Um, and this is testing AFXDP. This is the XDP part that can offload packets to user space. Again, there's a sample in the kernel that you can use. And what you can do is run on, on your XDP host, you can run the driver, uh, which what it does is that it dumps all the packets on the, on the user space and, you, and, and drops them at the same time. So you get some reports uh, on how many packets you received and how many packets you dropped. And then from another host, to start sending traffic to that interface and make sure that the packets arrive and are getting dropped correctly. Uh, the next slide. The next one is what you saw. There's, there's two things you can, you can do to test over here. One of them is create a namespace and then start injecting packets into that namespace while on your on your BPF program and, and the host that's running the BPF, you can run the XDP redirect from samples. 
Now, what should go in there, uh, what should happen is that the moment you start injecting packets into the, the interface of the first namespace, that should be right, redirected into V0, and then you should eventually check the outgoing traffic or your, of your ETH interface, and you should see the packets that you initially injected in V1 coming out of ETH0. Uh, the second thing you can do to test uh, is the, the slide that you saw from Lorenzo launching a virtual machine and doing pretty much the same thing there. Uh, the reason that this works is that you could very well have a, a, single, a, a single host with two interfaces on it and do the test on that host on real hardware. The problem with this approach is that both of the drivers you'll have on that host need to support NDO, XDP, XMIT, and, and XDP. Now, keeping in mind that the amount of drivers that, that support XDP is not, it's, it's rather limited at the moment, and it's mostly limited to 40 and 100 gigabit interfaces, getting access to two of them is substantially harder. So what you can piggyback on and what you can work on is that the Vertio interfaces on the kernel, the Vertio net and the VATH interface do support the XDP redirect. So you can use those with a few tricks and make sure that your driver is working uh, on all of the use cases XDP is trying to cover. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning here that there's also an IRC channel that we're trying to be active and help people around in case they need anything. The channel name is not too, too original, it's XDP in, on Freenode. So do anyone have any questions? There is a question on the, there's a question on the chat. Uh, I, I will stop my share the screen now. Yeah. Uh, for multi-buffers, does the requirement hold that its buffer is still contained within a page? Do you mean for the fragments or the, the first one has to be contained on a single page because that's, that's what serves the direct access, the BPF direct access requirement. So yeah, the, the, the memory model still, still remains there and that's, that's the whole reason for creating the page pool API in the first place. We do realize that you know, allocating a single, a single page for the network interfaces and, and doing the manual recycling uh, in every driver would mess things up and people would get out of line and probably have to fix a bunch of bugs. So that, that was the reason the page pool API was introduced in the first place because you pretty much get the recycling for free. It's uh, mostly debugged up to now. Yeah, we do have, um, okay, on ARM64 servers, we don't have too many statistics because there is, there is one driver that has been added um, on, on an NXP platform. I don't have numbers to it at the moment, but uh, the only tests we managed to do on an ARM server was on a one gigabit interface. And the performance was very similar, but frankly, with the amount of, you know, the CPU power you get nowadays, anyone could get the performance up on one gigabit interfaces. Moreover, if I can add something, I guess from my point of view is even very interesting to uh, add the XDP support even like on embedded device. For example, I think we should try to find a way to link together the ethernet part with the wireless one. For example, as far as I know, at the moment, there are some device that, wireless device that support uh, to offload the Ethernet frame instead of the wireless, instead of using the wireless header. So probably we, I guess from my point of view, it's doable to support at least the XDPTX part on the, on the, uh, on the wireless stuff. So we can just, for example, redirect from the Ethernet, inter from a, in, the, in a router, from the Ethernet interface to the, to the wireless one. Uh, there's another question, Jesper, uh, Jesper on the AFXDP deployment. You, you did have an interesting UK use case some months ago, right? Uh, I can't remember that one. You have the, 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 the time sensitive networking as a use case for yeah, the, the AFXDP one, I, we try to run some, exa some examples, even on ARM servers that you mentioned. Uh, so there's, there's time sensitive networking uh, going on uh, in Linux at the moment. That there has been some drivers that have been committed. And although, you know, when you're talking about traffic saving and stuff like that, you usually mention the upstream. 
uh, traffic uh, time sensitive networking has very this very bound latencies uh, so since you are really interested in speeding up uh, the use case the packet delivery from the driver down to user space since you have mostly user space applications dealing with the time sensitive stuff uh, the AFXDP use case proved to be interesting enough I mean we got I think we got four times less of uh, less latency than we got on the initial me measurements we did on the kernel network stack but that that kind of makes sense because you you know you you skip a bunch of stuff you don't need on this one uh, like firewalling or, or the TC hooks and the, the SKB allocation and a bunch of stuff yeah I can also see in the in, in the chat that people mentioned that actually you can run dpdk on top of afxdp and yeah you can and there's also obs open v switch that also have support for afxdp wasn't there an interesting application of afxdp from uh, cloudfare where they were dumping the ddos packets they got on a honey pot and then they I think they did it with AFXDP, so they had to drop a bunch of packets in user space, and they had a special application to to pass the packets and figure out uh, some of the things they wanted uh, on the attack. I, I can find the block. Uh, let me try and dig up the block. So, so the, the I want to mention the espresso bin that we we chose to play with, and the the, the driver we mentioned uh, in this this talk. We, we sort of chose it for several reasons. There was, all, there was actually a real use case that, that was, I think it was a Canadian uh, telco that wanted, that had this chip in, in, in some of the, the, the customer premises equipment uh, where, or was it GPON or something, where they wanted to redirect or have something faster that could, could, could do routing for them. So, I hope they are using that because I sort of lost contact with those guys, but they had a, had a real use case for, for speeding up this specific chip and we definitely uh, done that. Moreover, well, now so, there is even the, uh, let's say, I hand counterpart that is the uh, Macchiato bin that is now supporting the P as well. Oh yeah, that's right. The Macchiato bin, I actually have that hardware uh, right behind me somewhere, <laughs> but I haven't, haven't, haven't tested a kernel with that support yet. That would actually be interesting to see. Uh, so there's one question if, if we have to disable hardware checksum offloading with XDP. Uh, not, we don't need to, not, it's not fully supported. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it directly. So I wouldn't say we need to disable hardware checksum. Uh, but right now, at least when we send the packet, we have to run the receive. We can, we can still have it, but not. We cannot access it yet. Uh, but there's work in this area to improve this. May have a funny question. <laughs> Is there something lighter than XDP for fast packet forwarding? I don't quite get the question. Yeah, maybe I should just unmute. Um... So I've been trying to, you know, get faster tethering for Android. And the problem is we have a bazillion different drivers. You've got cellular interfaces, Wi-Fi interfaces, USB interfaces. The number of chipsets is infinite. The number of drivers is infinite, et cetera, et cetera. Um, trying to add XDP support to all of these drivers doesn't seem feasible. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, that's kind of my takeaway from, from, from this talk. Um, and at the same time, um, obviously, we'd like to get better performance, especially with 5G. Um, I've been looking at some of these drivers, and they seem pretty bad. Um, one of the common problems is there's like usually some sort of crazy non-GSO aggregation happening, where you get like multiple packets and a buffer. 
and then you basically allocate SKBs and copy the packets into the new SKB and or you do the reverse on the transmit side where you aggregate the packets. Like for example, in order to get good throughput on USB, you basically have to send more than an MTU of data. Yeah, um, that's, that's, that's typical even of on all the older 4G mod modems. Right. So kind of like, what, what do you think is the solution? <laughs> Please do my job for me. <laughs> one, 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 one comment first, then I'll just leave it to Lorenzo, I think. Uh, one comment is that I talked to the to the wireless guys, and I think we agreed that we should call it something else than XTP. But we might want to support, like and Lorenzo talked about, that we can redirect into a, a Wi-Fi device. But and then you mentioned you have to have aggregates to actually make it fast, which just depends on the multi-buffer work. Uh, but the, we I talked to the wireless guys, and they they wanted they wanted a BPF hook, but uh, we we should call it something else. It needs to be a new BPF hook. Does not call it HTTP, and then there's some other limitations with that. And there's there are definitely some things we can can do, and maybe we can do it in the the Mac layer instead of doing it for every driver. So there's there's people interested in this, and I think Lorenzo know more about this than me. I think, I mean, some times ago, like a couple of years ago, or something like this, I tried to propose something related to XTP on over Wi-Fi. And the main, the main the difficulties are, let's say, as I said before, on the rake side, since there are a lot of complexity and at the Mac layer for the protocol. But at least on the, just considering the TX side, I guess this is doable because so far there are uh, some devices, at least I can think about a couple of them that just, I'm just, uh, uh, speaking about X side that support the capability to offload an Ethernet frame instead of a wireless one. So all the let's say the complexity now is is offloaded into the card. So from let's say the not working point of view on the TIC side, there is no much difference between an Ethernet card and the wire and this wireless card. So I guess oh. it is doable to uh, support. I'll interrupt you here because okay. getting getting Wi-Fi chipset vendors to implement checksumming support is impossible. No, so nice if you think we're going to get any sort of real offload, <laughs> I think it's. No, no, I mean, I honestly, it, it, this is in my to-do list to I let's say to understand how let's say to prototype something on this. So this is. I can just explain my current idea so far. I have no the time to uh, work on this yet, but uh, I am sure that some some uh, some device can support it. I'm 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 confident. No, no, I, I'm not I'm not disputing that there's hardware out there that can support it. I'm just pointing out that there's plenty, plenty know, of yes, hardware yes, that can yes. support it. Um, I'm, I am say, I'm just saying that. It's doable for this new chipset, not for all of them. Right. I mean, there's there's chipsets coming out this year that don't support checksum. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like I, I I don't really have like you can't really go lower barrel than you know no offloads. That's kind of what the hardware we have to deal with is. Um, so 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 the reason I'm asking this is is because one of the things I see is, for example, when we receive from a cellular interface, um, we receive an aggregated packet. But of course, it's not GSO aggregation. It's just a bunch of packets that are back to back. We have to split this into multiple SKBs. Yes, so we basically allocate all the SKBs. We copy the data. And then we decide to forward the packets to a USB interface where the USB interface wants to aggregate all the packets. So now it basically allocates a bigger packet and copies all the data. So we're basically doing two, two, two copies, right? Yes. Um, but... Just to get packets from cellular to, to, to USB. And if we could do something, you know, to avoid one of those copies at least. Yeah, uh, I, first, let's say, if I understood correctly, what you mean is that this is on the rake side, not on the TX one, right? Well, there's, there's de-aggregation on the RX side and there's re-aggregation on the transmit side. It's just that, actually... you know... It's... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
Well, the, the, the driver it's coming in on and the driver it's leaving on are basically guaranteed to be different, right? So the aggregation requirements are basically guaranteed to be different. Um, plus, yes. along the way, some packets might have been not forwarded, so might have gone you know, locally to the device. This is pretty much not, a redirect. Not because because there might have been that and stuff in the middle as well. Yeah, but I, I can't think of anything else than, than what we have at the moment because essentially you need a fast path between the receiving end and the device you're going to send the packets out from. Now, the, the fact that you know you have to. Sorry? Aggregate. I think we have to take this off list because this, this is, we are, we are now in. This is another session's uh, time. Yeah, sorry. I, mm -hmm. I, I think we can continue to discuss offline about this. Yeah. Okay. So thank you everybody for, for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Bye.